Good morning. Happy Mother's Day, a blessed and belated Beltane. And thank you for joining this online virtual service of the First Unitarian Church of Alton on this ninth day of May, 2021. I'm Robin Berkeley, and I'm president of this congregation, and I also serve as a worship associate. The First Unitarian Church is a small lay-led congregation located in Alton, Illinois. Due to the pandemic, our services are now virtual and past and present and most recent services can be located on our church YouTube page. We hope to see you at our castle on the hill sometime soon when we can return to service together face to face. In the meantime, we welcome everyone to this virtual home of comfort, spirit, justice, and hope. We are Unitarian Universalists. We begin our worship with a prelude by our accompanist, Joy Heft. candle nearby, please join me as I light my own and recite our unison words for the chalice lighting. We hallow this time together by kindling the lamp of our heritage. Our opening prayer is written by James Vila Blake and is number 473 in the gray hymnal. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another.
Our theme for the month of May is union. This word has so many meanings. Of course, Beltane or May Day, May 1st, is the International Labor Day where we honor the hard work of organized labor. Unions and unionization um, was founded on the principle of collective strength and collective responsibility. Union is also a central part of yogic practice. Yoga means to yoke or to create a union between the mind and body to help us be mindful and grounded as we face daily challenges. Union also means connection and togetherness. For example, as we consider the union of marriage where two humans make a commitment to each other to live together as a couple in union. In all uses of the word, the goal of the word union highlights our collective responsibility to each other and to the planet. This word aligns beautifully with our UU principles, especially the following. Number three, the acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregation. Number six, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. And number seven, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. While I know very little about pagan beliefs, I know Beltane is a celebration of the peak of spring and the beginnings of summer. We begin harvesting early spring fruits and vegetables and greens. These foods nourish communities after a lean winter living off of food stores. It is also an important reminder that we depend on each other and Mother Earth in union to continue the cycle of life. Today is our flower communion, as you can see from the background of um, you know, the recording here. And this is where we share the beauty of the flora and fauna around us. Flowers are a product of a beautiful and bountiful spring, a representation of the union and covenant we hold between ourselves and Mother Earth. Please enjoy our show of flowers shared by our congregants to celebrate Mother's Day and the love of Mother Earth. To give you a little bit of background about flower communion, the flower celebration was initiated in Prague on June 4th, 1923 by Norbert Kopic, who was also the founder of the Unitarian Church in Czechoslovakia. He saw the need to unite the diverse congregants of his church from varying Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish backgrounds without alienating those who had left those traditions. For this reason, he honored the universal beauty of having a communion of flowers instead of the Eucharist. Though Unitarian Universalists often refer to the ritual as a flower ceremony, festival, or communion, Kapek's word, Aslava Kvetin, is more accurately translated as flower celebration, a term which continues to be preferred by Czech Unitarians today. The ritual was brought to the United States in 1940 by the Reverend Maja Kapik, Norbert's wife, and was widely adopted by the American Unitarian Churches and their successor Unitarian Universalist congregations. The prayer I'm about to share with you is from Reverend Kapik. Infinite spirit of life, we ask thy blessing on these, thy messengers of fellowship and love. May they remind us amid diversities of knowledge and of gifts to be one in desire and affection and devotion to thy holy will. May they also remind us of the value of com comradeship, of doing and sharing alike. May we cherish friendship as one of the most precious gifts. May we not let awareness of another's talents discourage us or sully our relationship, but may we realize that Whatever we can do, great or small, the efforts of all of us are needed to do the work of the world. Amen.
We offer the gentle reminder that this community of faith is supported only by your giving. We need each other, and in times of trial, we need each other even more. I challenge you all to not only consider stewardship to be your financial donations, but to also ask people to donate time and talent to help our church. If you can't write a check, can you donate some time to serve the church community? Can you volunteer to help clean up the grounds? Can you help make repairs where they are needed? Can you help, house, help by calling housebound members who would appreciate a call now and then to know that we still care? Please donate all you can with your time, talent, and or treasure. All are needed for our church to thrive. You can mail your financial gift to First Unitarian Church, P.O. Box 494, Alton, Illinois, 62002. Or you can give electronically by searching for First Unitarian Church of Alton on the GiveLify app or via the link on our webpage. As well, you can give through PayPal if you prefer. If you are willing to donate your time and talent, please contact a board member and let us know what you can do to help. Give what you will and what you are able, for you are a generous people. Please join me with our offering prayer. May this offering equip us to inspire love and seek justice. Today's reading is number 556 from the Gray Hymnal, These Roses, written by Ralph Waldo Emerson. These roses under my window make no reference to former roses or to better ones. They are for what they are. They exist with God today. There is no time to them. There is simply the rose. It is perfect in every moment of its existence. Before a leaf bud has burst, its whole life acts. In the full-blown flower, there is no more. In the leafless root, there is no less. Its nature is satisfied and it satisfies nature in all moments alike. But we postpone or remember. We do not live in the present, but with reverted eyes lament the past or heedless of the riches that surround us, stand on tiptoe to foresee the future. We cannot be happy or strong until we too live with nature in the present above time. As I said earlier in our service, the theme for the month is union. And I was thinking about, 
you know, all the different ways that we think about the term union. We think about union when we think about marriage. We think about unions just based on the idea of organized labor and unions coming together collectively. And, um, and that really resonated for me this month, uh, communion being really important. I grew up Catholic, right? So communion for us is the way to connect with um, the Eucharist, to connect with uh, Jesus and um, our faith tradition, you know, in that context that we now as you know, bold second and third graders now get to go up and be a part of the larger community by taking this communion, they taking uh, part in that ritual. And, and, and I like the little story about the background of why flower communion or flower celebration uh, came to be because it was trying to replace that ritual with another ritual that could cut across different faith traditions in order to be able to give people the sense of feeling connected in community. And there's a whole host of different ways that we can bring people together in community. Um, but, you know, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an expression of spring and an expression of what flowers are standing for, for us, it stands for beauty, it stands for nature, it stands for, um, um, you know, strength and a, a commitment, um, if you will. Brides carry flowers, you know, as they walk down the aisle. Um, flowers are given as part of a community gesture to thank someone or to show, uh, you know, shared grief. Um, we send flowers to somebody. We give flowers when we love somebody. Um, so flowers represent connection at some level and I, and I truly feel this and it and it's um you know it's been kind of interesting to, to sort of reflect on this a little bit more and I, it's not something that I ever gave a lot of thought to I love flowers you can see right here um and I have um planted flowers and I'm planting more flowers and I'm planting my garden and as I'm digging into my new home and trying to make it mine and and there's a lot of green here but there's not a lot of flowers here so I'm trying to add more flowers um, and part of some of my roses and and flower baskets were in in our little video um, and I'm sure you all saw your your photos in there which is really nice um, but I think about the different things that the community, the com that communion or union means. And then I thought about the word communion. So com meaning community. I don't, and I'm not sure that's the, the etiology of the, of, the, of the word, but I kind of liked it the way I'm going to think about it. So communion is sort of the community unifying, coming together. It's about building fellowship. It's about feeling connected to the larger group to the larger world and um and and that's really the foundation of what unitarian universalism is right the universe the the universal ways that we can find expression of who we are and what we believe in and and the fact that we believe that we are all connected and we are all responsible for each other and to each other in so many ways and I think to the lessons that I try to teach my students, right, about this idea of national culture and, and how national cultures differ across a whole different types of dimensions. And um, some of them are based on power distance. You know, some, some cultures uh, are much more different to people with higher authority. Um, and so we, we see this in, in cultures like South Korea where um, there's a tremendous difference to authority um, and you'll find South Korean students never question authority in the classroom. Um, so we learn how to bring them out and how to help them to feel like they are more um, um, free, you know, here in the United States to speak up and to ask questions and to not just take you know, the teacher in the classroom as, you know, as, as the be all and end all authority on everything. We're facilitators for learning. We're not the expert on, on experts on everything, right? Although, you know, 
I'd like to think I am, but of course I know that I'm not. <clears throat> so besides power distance, we've got things, um, masculine versus feminine cultures and masculine cultures tend to be focused on achievement. And we tend to be more of a masculine culture here in the United States versus Scandinavia, which tends to be much more feminine culture. Another other types of, of masculine cultures are things like Japan um, and, 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 and masculine cultures also have very clear defined sex roles, right? Men do this, women do this. And of course, here in the United States, as we are embracing this idea of gender identity and gender fluidity, and that gender is a social construct, right? This idea of masculine feminine doesn't really make sense for us anymore. So, you know, how do we build community, you know, when we're we, to around this idea that there's not a binary, that there are a wide variety of expressions of who people can be, even in the, uh, the, the spectrum of gender identity. I think Ella Berg and I were talking today about this idea of, you know, um, that there's more than just male, female, and intersex, that there's a whole spectrum of, of, um, of expression out there that's available for people, people with differentiations and hormones and things like that. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent, um, but it but it it was just really powerful made to think about you know as we think about what community is and how we are in flux here in the United States as we always are I suppose, but but we see it and we feel it more saliently around issues of how do we create community for people who have been othered. How do we do this around issues of race, around issues of gender, around and gender identity, sexual orientation, um, you know, masculine, feminine, if those constructs even matter anymore. Um, you know, I, I, I look to my own daughter who says, gender identity just doesn't matter to me. It just goes, I don't, I don't care. She goes, I know that I'm born in a female body, but it just doesn't matter. I, I, it just doesn't matter to me. I just see the world as more of something very fluid and, and I'm comfortable, you know, with what any way that I identify. Um, anyway, um, so we've got this idea of masculine feminine cultures. Um, another angle is um, uh, individualism versus collectivism. And that's really the one I wanted to focus on because Hofstede um, has looked at um, individualism and cultures that are much more individualistic versus um, uh, collectivist cultures. Now, collectivist cultures tend to be sort of Asian cultures where people are looking at what we can do for each other, what we do for the collective, what we do for the group. And we're not talking Borg collective kind of thing. And we're, we're just a little dysfunctional, right? A little Star Trek ears coming up, but more the community. What do we do for the community? And, 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 and you hear in many collectivist cultures, this notion of, um, you know, the when the individual stands up in a collective culture, they're, 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 they're forced to sit back down and to keep the collective um, at the forefront of the needs of the community versus the needs of the individual. Um, and the community comes first and the community's needs are what matter. Um, and, and, and this was really salient in, the, in, the, in a movie, uh, I mean, a, a little series that I saw on Netflix, which unfortunately did not get renewed and I can't remember the name of it right now, but it was, um, uh, Hillary Swank was in it and it was people going on a three-year mission to explore Mars. And they had this whole plan in place how they were going to do this. And it was a multi-country communal effort, right? To, um, to make this work. And the, the, the idea was that, you know, there was a lot of trade-offs and negotiations. What, 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 what will I take? What will I give? What will I trade off? What will I accept as, you know, what will I, you know, what will I give, you know, and, and what will I um, let go of? And one of the things that happened was China, um, China um, agreed to allow their person to go up there, but that she had to be the person that would be photographed first as the first person to step foot on Mars. And it was part of the negotiation. And, and in the midst of all this, it comes, it comes 
to pass that she had disgraced her culture and her um, family by falling in love with a woman. And, um, and they isolated her from this woman and they shamed her for falling in love with this woman, but she was expected to do her duty for the community. Um, and not to spoil the ending, but I'm going to spoil the ending for you because it was really powerful. The group that had made it to Mars, and they almost didn't make it there. In the end, there was this huge debate about, you know, should we do this collectively or should we allow, or should she continue to uh, stand up and, and, and be the individual and do her duty for her country? And, and they stood behind her and they said, you know, we think they're taking advantage of you in, in, for all intents and purposes. And we want to support you. And if you want, we can put a royal, you know, F you, you know, to China and we will all stand on the planet together with a photo of us all together communally um, looking at this. So it's interesting how we see these different layers of community and union and what they mean. And, and so that when the state expects you to be, you know, to put yourself, put yourself back, you know, to support the community, but at the same time really suppresses your individuality, you know, how do we also take into account that smaller community that was on that little little spaceship heading off to Mars and how they develop their own community and their own sense of loyalty and justice and what was fair and what was right. And in the end, um, because they had taken advantage of her, because they had hurt her and they had shamed her, um, they decided that they were going to do a communal picture and not just an individual picture. And that was a way of sending the message to China that this person, despite the, the importance of the community, that this person's individuality um, was of value and that they didn't, they shouldn't have dehumanized her, you know, right, by, by doing that. And, 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 you, and you might think, well, you know, I'm, I'm pro-community or anti-community or whatever, and I'm not. It's, it's a struggle that I think we have here in the United States, right, where it's this notion of individuality versus community. We see this being played out across the board. When Hofstede did his research, the United States was considered the single most individualized culture on the planet. We are number one in being the most individualistic, where we value individual fortitude, individual rights, individual duties and responsibilities. And we don't put a lot of emphasis on what our duties are to each other, but more about what we can do to individually achieve and individually um, succeed. And, and this, this plays out in our history and in our culture when we think about the rugged individualists who um, who populated the West and and they in the westward expansion. Here we are in St. Louis, right? So the westward expansion, and you know, everybody was like, "Oh, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to be on my own." And yet, we know in reality, as much as there were a lot of individuals that were out there doing their thing, they needed each other. That there was a sense still of community and collectivism. And that, you know, you helped me put my barn up and I helped you, you know, sow your crops. Um, you did sewing and I did baking and we helped each other um, and we did this together. So this, it's a myth for us to believe that only individuals and individuals looking out for themselves are the things that made this country successful. Because in, in reality, it is community and it is communal connection, um, no matter whether it's your small tribe that you've turned to, you know, of good friends that you can depend on and lean into, or your church community, right, or your city, or your, or your town, or your village, or your university, or your job, or your state, but we need each other, we need each other desperately. And so I think there's always this tension, right, of honoring individuality and respecting individuality, but also respecting 
the collective, the community, the union? And how do we walk that line between respecting our individual rights and values and, in, and needs and our communal rights and needs? And we see this played out in politics. I mean, right? We hear people saying, I'm not going to wear a mask because that feels like it's a suppression of my individual rights. Okay. Where does our responsibility, our rights end as individuals and our, our rights and duties to our community come into play? And it varies for everybody. And I see this played out in, and again, when I, when I have my students engage in ethical analysis um, as part of their MBA training, I have them do a, a fairly in-depth paper on critically analyzing um, different ethical lenses. And we have some lenses that are much more focused on individual rights and duties and individual accountability. Um, and then, um, and then we have those lenses or ethical theories that are focused much more on the community. Rawls justice theories and Aristotle's virtue ethics. These are things that are focused on what does the community say is right? What does the community need? What duty do we have to our community versus you know, things like universalism and, and utilitarianism, which is much more focused on individual rights and, and not violating individual expression of their rights, but yet still treating everybody as fairly and, and, and consistently as, as we can. And so, um, we see this played out in politics because we have people with, you know, that are much more focused on what their individual rights are and they don't care about the community. Um, we see this played out in ethical analysis when we're balancing this idea of individual rights and community rights. I mean, it's always a very fine line to walk. And as I, as I say to my students, there's no, there's no hard right or wrong answer on this. Um, and, and, it, and it is important for us to allow individuals to have their expression, um, to be who they are meant to be and to, to value what they choose to value. While at the same time, we, we need to have a duty to each other and a duty to um, our communities and our planet and the universe, however we choose to define this. You know, we recognize that we are interconnected. It's, it's, it's essential and it's a part of our, our UU principles, right? The interconnected web of life for which we have a responsibility to each other to manage these things. And so I, I don't have any answers. I wish I did, but, I, but I'm struggling regularly with this balance between individual versus individualism versus collectivism. And, and, and we struggle in this country with really getting people to think more collectively than, than we do, you know, to getting them to, 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 to sort of rise up to be more individuals. And there are people that tend to more towards collectivism than individualism, but generally speaking, we're really over here in that, on that individualism side where most people are, are more concerned about you know, what, what they need, what they're going to take away. Um, and, and does it affect me? Great. If it doesn't affect me, I don't care about it. Um, and, 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 and that's a hard thing for me personally. I was having dinner with a friend this evening. Um, I'm, I'm recording this on Friday night, by the way, but I had dinner with a friend this evening and we were talking about how it's so hard for her and I both to think about not giving back to the community and not doing what we can for the greater community. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't take care of myself or that I don't look out for myself. I'm not going to push myself to my exhausted limit. I will take time to protect myself and to take care of myself. But part of my duty and part of who I am fundamentally is about giving back to communities and and supporting the community and doing what I can for the community. And she's the same way, this, this individual in particular. 
is a very big voting rights advocate in, um, in St. Louis, and she's very politically active and very active in the arts. And, and, and this was, it was just this very wonderful, deep conversation that we had about how do we get people to understand how important it is to be connected to each other and to support each other and to, and to love and, and, and be there for each other um, and the responsibility that we have to each other in that, in that manner. Um, you know, part of it, it could be upbringing, right? Um, she grew up in a very tight-knit family and was taught, you know, to be, they had a duty to each other in, a, in this tight-knit family. And they also have a duty, you know, to their community to give back and to, to be activists and to have a voice. And my parents were the same way. My, my mom was very much involved in social action. She worked in Dorothy Day, the Dorothy Day um, a homeless shelter with my dad on a regular basis, um, you know, and giving back to the community. So social activism was always an important part of my upbringing. Um, and I think that we as Unitarian Universalists work very hard to do that as well. And we do need to support each other. We need to support our larger community. We need to support our nation. We need to support our planet. We, you know, and we, we exemplify those values, those collectivist values of taking care of each other. But yet that wonderful balance, right, of allowing people to express their own path to what is meaningful for them spiritually. Um, I think that we walk a beautiful line between the need for individualism and individual expression, but at the same time embodying our duty to each other. And then I got to think, wow, I, and this is all just sort of sort of congealing for me right here as I'm thinking about this. And I think about our founding fathers and, and, and while they valued individual rights, they also believed we had a duty to take care of each other, right? I think that they truly believe that. And because so many of them were Unitarians and I don't know how you could not believe that, right? That allowing that individual expression and individual rights, but also um, a duty to each other as a community. So we become the United States and we are united as a union um, coming together to support each other. And, and we need to support each other across state lines just, you know, to make sure we each all have what we need. Um, I don't know, I'm sort of rambling a bit and I appreciate that. It's also like 1.20 in the morning as I'm recording this, so I'm a little tired, but bear with me folks, it comes together in the end. I think we as you use really do have the gift of being able to balance in a lovely and affirming way individual rights and collective rights, that we work really hard to connect each other, right, to the larger, um, to our larger values. And we support each other and we believe in collective action and we believe in social justice for those that are the most oppressed. And that takes collective action to be able to do that, to be in a union, to connect as a community but we also really respect individual paths and we give people space to do that. So we are good role models for this. And I hope that we can continue to practice this and, um, and show people what it means to be part of community. Um, and we can do this, right? Through our daily actions, but also I love that our rituals try very hard to show how we're connected, what we value, what we, um, what we are expressing. And so where does this all come together for me? As I start thinking about us as a community here at First Unitarian, you know, we've got a lot of changes ahead of us. And I know I've been saying this for the better part of a year, but we're going to start to see these changes now as we transition back to our face-to-face -face services, which for those of you that are watching online that maybe don't live here locally, don't worry, we're not going away. We will always have a YouTube presence. We will always have our services online um, streamed live at 10 o'clock 
um, or whatever hour we decide as a community to um, to choose to do that. But right now we'll, we'll stick with 10 o'clock. That's what we're doing. Um, and our services will be streamed live. So you can still be a part of this community and you'll be able to watch you know what we're doing um, in 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 the in the church in in the sanctuary, um, singing with us as you need to, um, and being a part of our larger community. We are reimagining who we are in a larger way, so that the larger community, right, can still partake in this, even if you don't live in Alton, because we're looking out for the community and what the community means. We're reimagining that our community is going to be a little bit larger and a little bit different than what we've done before. I love the idea that we're gonna be live streaming and that, that means so much to me. Um, it's something that the UU has talked about, but it was something that we as a board had already decided that we wanted to do um, even before the, U, the UUA said, hey, let's make sure we're doing hybrid services. There are other things that are gonna change, right? With COVID, things that we've done before, we may not be able to do, at least in the near term, hopefully, you know, it will change and we can move back there. But that's the thing about change, we're going to have to be thinking about how do we make community in a different way? How do we connect to people in a way that we haven't done before, so that we can continue to feel connected um, to each other, but respecting individual differences, respecting that everybody's got a different path. Um, we wanna make sure that we are, um, uh, you know, that we have the rituals that matter to us, our joys and sorrows and our water ritual uh, for that. And, um, you know, offertories and different ways of, of doing our services and different ways of doing coffee hour. Um, and you've all been really resilient and I, and I appreciate that so much. Um, I appreciate each and every one of you for the work that you've done to still stay connected to this church, despite these tough times of being, you know, isolated from each other. You know, getting to see each other in community was wonderful and it felt good and it felt healthy. And um, the more that we can do that, the more I think we're going to feel a bigger part of this community again. So I'm saying this because expecting some changes in the way that we are building community it's a new normal. So let's be open-minded to this idea that there's going to be a new normal. There's going to be a new way of being. And while the old way was lovely, we also have to respect that times change, people change, the world changes, and we adapt to it and still recognize that what makes us a community is not our building, but it's the love and the respect of the people that are in it, who care for each other, who care for the community at large, who care for the planet, who do all the right things to make us feel like we are an important um, part of our, 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 our global community. So that's where we're at. Anyway, it is now officially 1.30 a.m. and I'm done. <laughs> Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the service.
announcements for the week. We are trying desperately to schedule regular work days at the church at least once a month. Typically, we are trying to schedule them on the second Saturday of each month. However, the last two months have not really been very cooperative regarding the weather. We've had some rainy days. Um, so we are trying to get up there when we can, when the weather allows, when we have opportunities. For example, last Saturday, not this past, not yesterday, but last Saturday, a whole bunch of us got one up there and tried to do some work on the grounds when we could. Um, so we're doing our best, but we're hoping that you can try to be flexible. And if you see a great day and you have an opportunity to wander up there and you'd like to be able to weed um, or do some you know, repairs around the church, you know, contact some of us and see if we can get some people up there to work with you. Um, you know, we'll try to announce on the UU Friends uh, group page on Facebook when people are heading up there. So if you decide to join us, we would greatly appreciate that. We've had weeding that's been done. That's been a big part of what we need to do on the grounds right now. And we've been working on getting benches painted and things ready for us to return because it's come and close, folks. I'm very excited about that. So um, do what you can. Please join us when you can. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Um, we need help with cleaning. We need help with, with uh, repairs. We need help with all sorts of different things. But anything that you can offer, um, your time, your talents, um, every minute that you can give to us, we greatly appreciate it. We are a small congregation, which means we need everybody to pull a little bit of weight. Not a lot. Everybody. If everybody gave an hour a month to, to help in some way, wow, the things that we could do. And it would be pretty amazing. So I hope that you will consider what hour or hours can you give to the church to help us with getting things ready to return to the congregation to um, to those live services. Stewardship, as I'm reminding you again, we are in preparation for our stewardship campaign. Eric Johnson and I are working on our letters and our asks for people. Um, we're asking people to not only donate monetarily, but we're also asking people to pledge to work on a project or series of projects, um, given what I just said regarding the things that we need with buildings and ground. We're developing this list. And, um, and with and a whole, also a list of community outreach activities. And our goal is to ask people to pledge some time, right? Any time um, for these events. Like I said, an hour a month, an hour a quarter, a couple of hours every quarter, a couple hours a year, whatever you can give, we desperately need everybody's help and we need everybody's support in order to get our congregation back to live services. So um, we need to get our face out there. We need to do our community outreach. We've already done our fourth Saturday, as you know, um, which was growing and is going to continue to grow. We need some volunteers to help um, with the next distribution on um, May 24th. We are asking uh, people who are vaccinated to please come and to please help with gathering items and distributing items. We have it as low contact and low risk as possible, and we hope that you will be able to make it. So look in the coming weeks for information on the stewardship in terms of the donations that you make to the church, as well as your donation of time and talent uh, to help us to be the beacon on the hill that we want to be. Our pandemic task force, um, is, which includes uh, Wayne Polish, um, Ed Navarra, uh, Mary Weber, and um, uh, Marcy Bennett and myself, we met uh, last week to discuss what it's going to take us to get back into the church, um, to, to live services where we can gather again. And we have a phased in plan that we have started to develop and we're working through that, get approval from the board. And then we will share that with the congregation as soon as we're able. Um, it's gonna be a phased in plan. Um, so expect it not to be jump in as if it was, you know, nothing changed, um, you know, two years ago as if we were doing what we did two years ago. We're gonna have to make some adaptations to some of our rituals. We're going to have to make 
some changes to the way that we do things to keep things as safe for the most vulnerable people in our congregation who want to join us for church. This is our mission, right? To make sure that we are taking care of those that are least able to, um, to be able to um, uh, handle you know, uh, the pandemic, but who still want to be a part of our congregation. So um, with that in mind, you know, again, expect to see some information from folks um, coming in the next week, uh, announcing what it is that we want to do and how we're going to do it. Um, please keep an open mind. We're going to be experimenting with things. Some things are going to work. Some things are not going to work, but we're going to try. And we welcome your feedback on what we can do differently and how we can embrace old rituals, find new ones, and figure out a way for us to be together that's safe and sound for everybody involved. Thank you. Please contact the church office if you have uh, an event or an announcement that you would like to share via our weekly church this week. If you are interested in receiving our weekly email, please send your contact details to church at firstuualton.org. And please share with us your joys and sorrows. We want to know what's going on that makes you happy. We want to know where you have some issues that you need support from us. Even if you cannot share what the event is, know that we have your back, know that your church family loves you, and we will do what we can to send you love and support, um, whatever you need. Remember to join us for our virtual services on YouTube coming up. Um, you know, on a regular basis. We're actually going to be streaming from now on all of our services live on YouTube once we start returning to our live services. We will not be doing pre-recorded services, um, except on a rare situation where, you know, weather conditions or something doesn't allow us to do it. But our plan is to try to make sure that we can have um, a live stream of our services available for people on YouTube, um, so that even if you don't feel comfortable coming back right now, or you might feel like getting into the church because of accessibility issues is just not an option for you, we are still going to be here for you. We're still going to have our live services out there for you so you can see, you can participate, you can feel like you are part of our community. Uh, and we're looking and trying to figure out, which will come in time, how to get us to do that also, not just for the service, but also for coffee hour. We're experimenting. We're taking risks, folks. Be patient. Thank you. And if you have a lit chalice or candle near you, I invite you to join me in extinguishing your chalice. The light of truth and meaning cannot be put out. We are keepers of this flame until we can meet again. So our closing words are reading 723, the Flower Communion Prayer by Reverend Capek. In the name of Providence, which implants in the seed, the flower, the future of the flower, and in our hearts, the longing for people to live in harmony. In the name of the highest in whom we move and who makes all humans what they are. In the name of sages and great religious leaders, who sacrificed their lives to hasten the coming of the age of mutual respect. Let us renew our resolution sincerely to be real brothers and sisters, regardless of any kind of bar which estranges us from each other. In this holy resolve, may we be strengthened knowing that we are God's family, that one spirit, the spirit of love unites us and endeavor for a more perfect a more joyful life. Amen. Ashe. Blessed be. And have a beautiful, beautiful Mother's Day. Have a beautiful week. Have a beautiful spring. And I look forward to seeing you all soon.